Okay, right. Fab. So, um, can I hand over to you, Alan, to, to kick us off? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Charlotte, and hi, everybody. So I'm up in Findhorn in the northeast of Scotland, and I'm just going to switch on screen sharing and start my presentation, which is about rewilding and the restoration of the Caledonian forest in the highlands of Scotland. So here we go. I hope you can all see this. Is that clear? Everybody see the screen? I'm assuming you can, yes. Okay, yes. so um, just to give you a bit of background, um, in 1986, I was inspired to start a project um, because I became aware of the plight of the Caledonian forest, the native forest that used to cover most of the highlands, and there was very little that left at the time, and it was in danger of disappearing. So uh, this presentation is mainly focused on the work I did for that over a period of 30 years. Uh, but I'm going to start with a little bit of a global perspective, first of all, just to articulate the need for rewilding. And then at the end, I'll also return to the global perspective again, just as a, as a, a context, a frame for the Scottish experience. So you've probably all seen this photograph before, taken in 1968 by the Apollo astronauts before they went to the moon, uh, the Earth from space. And out of thousands, this is the picture that's almost always used because it shows the outline of the African continent. Many of the uh, pictures of the Earth from space show mostly cloud and ocean. But here you can see Africa, you can see uh, the Arabian Peninsula. If you look closely, you can see Madagascar. And down at the bottom, the white mass is Antarctica. I've had this on the wall of my room for many, many years. And one day, about 20 years ago, I suddenly realized that there was something wrong with the photograph, that the most obvious thing in it is the brown areas, the deserts. And although deserts are natural ecosystems on the planet, most of what we see in this photograph is desertified areas, areas that have been degraded by human activities over thousands of years. And we know that 2000 years ago, the top of the photograph, North Africa, was called the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. And there were big forests there in which animals like the Atlas bear and the Barbary lion roamed, both of which sadly are now extinct. And Madagascar, uh, one of the most desertified countries on the planet, uh, of huge risk to all the biodiversity there. So this is a picture of an unhealthy planet, actually. It's a picture of what I would call a wounded world that has suffered at the hands of humanity. So the need for rewilding, I think, is obvious to many people. Uh, along with that destruction of native habitats has gone massive in um, industrialization and urban urbanization. Here on the left, you can see part of London with nothing green in sight at all. And the right hand photograph is from Borneo, uh, Kalimantan on the island of um, Borneo. And, um, its area cleared for uh, oil palm plantations, originally tropical rainforest, the home to orangutans and many other creatures. So what we've got in the world today is a, a modern culture, which to me is, is addicted to endless economic growth. There's never enough, it always has to be more. And it has an unstated uh, implicit objective of what I term the enslavement of the planet. It's the exploitation of every square inch of the planet's surface, land and ocean for human material gain. And that's of course leading us to destruction. And we know that through climate change issues, we know that through the biodiversity crisis and the looming sixth mass extinction. So that is the background I want to sort of make this presentation against. And coming to Scotland then, this is the Northwest Highlands. This is Glenafric. Some of you may have been there. Um, it's situated west of Inverness. And this is the ruins of a forest ecosystem that flourished there for thousands of years after the last ice age ended. And you can see there's not a living tree in sight. It's all green, but it's just grass. And in this, what we call a peat hag in the foreground where erosion, the wa erosion from water has washed away the vegetation, you can see the, the stumps, the roots of our vanished forest. This is a tree cemetery. This is a forest graveyard. This is what we've inherited from previous generations. And if you go out with ecologically oriented eyes, you can see the evidence for our vanished forests in many parts of the highlands. Uh, these are two other areas of Glenafric. On the left, this is what's called a snag, a standing dead pine. That tree would have been alive 50 years ago. And you can see there's no living trees in the background left. And on the right, another stump, 
Some of these stumps in the peat hags have been dated to 4,000 years old, but others, such as this one here, which is not buried in the peat, you can see it's above the vegetation, that probably was a living tree 200 years ago. So we have this depleted landscape in the highlands. The peat hags are like wounds that scar the land in many places. And, um, the peat gets eroded and washed down the rivers. There's no um, riparian forest to hold the banks in place. So big blocks of peat get washed down, stranded on a gravel bar here on the right. And if you look in the background, you can see a ruin of an old croft house. People used to live in this landscape, um, but they can't live there anymore. There's nothing to support them. And the people were forced off the land in many cases in the latter part of the 18th century, after the Battle of Culloden, when the Highlanders were defeated, their lands were forfeited and sheep were brought in by the new landlords in large numbers. And large numbers of deer were also encouraged uh, after the extermination of the wolf. And we upset the balance of the land so that no regeneration of trees or other vegetation has been able to take place for over 200 years. This, by contrast, is what the Highlands should look like. This is uh, further east in Glen Affric, which is one of the best remnants of the old Caledonian forests. And on the left there, you can see uh, what is probably one of the best views in the whole of Scotland, showing what the country must have been like thousands of years ago. Mountains in the distance, a mixture of trees, the green Scots pines, the yellow birches in autumn, and lochs, water, lots of water. And that to me is very pleasing to the eye. That's a rich and varied landscape that's capable of supporting life, both animal life and indeed people. And under the canopy of the trees, there was a rich understory. You can see heather and flower on the right here, and the bright green is blaeberries, what you in England will call um, bilberry, but here in the Highlands we know them as blaeberries. So that's what we should be having here. And there's only tiny remnants of this left today. And it's the habitat for a number of scarce species. Uh, on the left, we've got the capercaillie, the largest grouse in the world. This was actually exterminated in Britain in um, the 1700s, and birds were reintroduced to the highlands of Scotland from Scandinavia. They became re-established, but it's now at risk again. And on the right, twin flower, a very special flower, which grows all around northern latitudes of the world. I've seen it in Canada and Norway and other countries. Uh, it's very abundant there, but here it's extremely rare. And that's sadly the fate of many of the species uh, that depend on the forest habitat in Scotland. So here's a graphic image showing uh, what's happened. On the left, the shaded area shows the original extent of the native pine woods at their maximum, probably about 4,000 years ago. Uh, if you're wondering why there's a big diagonal gap across the middle of it, uh, that's the Great Glen, which is where Loch Ness and other lochs are situated. It's mostly water, so there were never any trees there. And on the right, the dark areas are the surviving remnants, most of which are concentrated in the Cairngorms, as you can see. And the shaded area there is the area that uh, I've envisaged as a major rewilding project, uh, restoration of the forest in about a thousand square miles, uh, a largely roadless uninhabited area where some good remnants are, as you can see. So we've only got about 2% of our forest left. The problem is that 2% is dying on its feet. It's what I call a geriatric forest. It's like going to an old people's home. And the problem is that the trees are coming to the end of their lives, 250, 300 years old, um, and they're dying. And that's a natural process. There's nothing wrong with that. But what is seriously wrong is that there's no new trees coming to take their place. They still produce viable seeds, seedlings germinate, but for 200 years, every seedling that's germinated has been eaten by deer or sheep. And you can see deer in the left-hand photograph here. Deer today are thought of as animals of the open landscape, but actually they belong in the forest. That's their natural habitat. Uh, they should be there, but in the absence of predators and by getting fed in winter by landowners, their numbers have increased dramatically uh, by over, uh, they've doubled in the past 40 years or so. And we still have more sheep than people in Scotland today. We have about 5.3 million people, 6 million sheep. And those herbivores, in the absence of predators, roam wherever they want and eat all the young trees. And you can see in the middle photograph here, a pine seedling. And you can see it's got very few needles left. And most of the damage is done in winter because there's not much else to eat then. And uh, that's when uh, a lot of the browsing takes place. 
So we've got this huge generation gap of old trees dying on their feet, standing up, as you can see in the right hand picture, and nothing to replace them. Now, pines are actually not very palatable. I don't know if anybody's ever tried eating a pine seedling, but they're, uh, they're rather spiky. It's a bit like having acupuncture done on your tongue, and they're quite bitter. But uh, other trees are preferentially eaten. Rowan in particular, a uh, broadleaf tree, a pioneer species, is uh, more palatable than anything else. Deer will eat it before anything else. And this is a particular cluster of rowans I photographed over a period of 23 years. So in the top left hand picture you can see October 1992 and the trees there already had browsing damage. I don't know how old they were. They could have been there for 20 years before I found them and took the photograph. Um, but if you follow through 96, 99, 2004, all the way to 2015, you will see that actually they've been eaten back repeatedly over that time. And in 2015 um, the stems were shorter than they were in October 1992. And if you look in the background, there's not a single living tree in sight. And this is the issue, there's nothing to eat. So any tree that germinates, any seedling that gets established, rowan seeds are distributed by birds, um, so they can travel a long way in a bird's gut and then deposited in its droppings. Um, it becomes an immediate target and you'll need one deer in a landscape like this to find those rowans and eat them and stop them growing. That's been happening for 200 years. Sheep also cause of major damage. Uh, they're not native here, but obviously they've been brought in. And in fact, the Highland Clearances saw many Highland estates cleared of people who were forced to go to the slums of Glasgow or to Nova Scotia in Canada or New Zealand or Australia. And sheep replaced them. And sheep also browse everything down to the ground. So on the left-hand photograph there, you see solitary sheep in a pine wood, but think back to the picture I showed earlier with the flowering heather and the blaberries and that lush, deep um, understory. Here it's like a lawn, a contoured lawn. And on the right, uh, no sheep in this picture um, because the sheep have been removed from this area, but their impact remains. And these horizontal pattern is the result of trampling on slopes for hundreds of years. So the sheep are gone there, but their impact still remains. It doesn't have to be like this. In 2015, I took a group of staff from Trees for Life to Southwest Norway, where um, that area has had a somewhat similar history to Scotland. It was overexploited and uh, the people were struggling to survive, but there was no forced clearance of Norway in the Southwest. Instead, in the early part of the last century, uh, some people went to the US uh, to win in Minnesota and Wisconsin and settled there and they discovered that the US government was offering people who settled that part of the country free areas of land so they invited all their relatives and friends from southwest Norway to go there. So there was this mass exodus from southwest Norway and when the people left they were not replaced by sheep, they were not replaced by deer. And what's happened is that in 100 years, the forest has recovered. And you can see in the right hand picture, a young regenerating forest. Nobody planted those trees. That's what happened when people left and there was no excessive numbers of herbivores uh, to keep the vegetation down. The left hand picture from Wester Ross in Scotland, many people think, oh, Scotland's too damp, it's too wet, the soils are too poor, trees will never grow there. Well, actually, if you look at it in Norway, it's further north, it's wetter, it's colder, the soils are similar and the trees have recovered. So we know it can happen in Scotland. We just need to make a decision to allow it to take place. So with that background, then I want to talk a little bit about rewilding. And for me, there's three main elements to uh, helping uh, ecosystems recover. The first is because we've got such a low baseline of just overgrazed grass or stunted heather in most places is we have to have restoration of healthy vegetation communities because the vegetation is what supports everything else. It supports the herbivores and they in turn support the herbivore, uh, the predators. Uh, so the whole food web depends on healthy vegetation. So that has to be the starting point. Then we have to re-establish some of the key ecological processes because at the moment most of the highlands are in a state of ecological freezing. Um, it's like an outdoor museum. We go to see, uh, go to museums to see dead relics of the past frozen in time and that's what we've got in the highlands. We've got these landscapes frozen at the minimal level of biological productivity, unable to develop as they would naturally. 
So those processes include succession, the change from one vegetation community to another, nutrient cycling, natural disturbance, predator-prey dynamics. And then the third element, which is the one that is often most associated with rewilding uh, because it's dramatic, uh, is the reintroduction of missing species. And that can include large mammals and apex predators all the way up to the wolf and the lynx, but it also can include smaller things. Many of our woodland fragments in Scotland, for instance, are isolated from each other by large distances of treeless ground. So those small remnants, many of them no longer have red squirrels, one of our indigenous native species, which still thrives in Scotland. It's in Scotland, the Caledonian forest is its stronghold in the UK. Um, but many of our smaller isolated woodland remnants don't have squirrels anymore. So that's a, a case of reintroduction or translocation to bring them back. And I'll show you that a bit later. So these are the three main elements, uh, in my view, that are required for rewilding. Reducing herbivore numbers is the critical step to getting vegetation recovery. And that can be done in two ways. One is by reducing the numbers, taking sheep off the land and culling deer to bring their numbers down significantly. So these two scenes here are areas I've not been involved with directly, but others have taken work on them there. Uh, on the left, Glen Feshi, a privately owned estate where the owner uh, has drastically reduced deer numbers to a very low level. And all the young pines that you see there are growing spontaneously from the seeds from the old trees in the background. Nothing has been planted. And on the right, Craig Meggy National Nature Reserve, which is owned by Nature Scott, the Scottish Government Conservation Agency. They've done a similar thing there, uh, reducing deer numbers significantly, and they've got tremendous regeneration of birch dominated woodland. So that's one way, that's the best way to do it, uh, is reducing the population of herbivores and let nature take its own course. But in much of the highlands, that's not a viable option because uh, landowners in many cases have a vested interest in keeping deer on the land because the only way they can make any money off the depleted landscape is trophy hunting of the stags. So they want more deer. So in those situations, fencing uh, is the option to keep deer out of certain areas where uh, tree recovery, forest regeneration can occur. So this is the first project I was involved with personally, uh, and I raised money in 1990 to fence off an area of 50 hectares in Glen Affric, land that's um, owned by the Forestry Commission, now called Forestry and Land in Scotland. And um, at the time, because of budget cuts from the Thatcher government, they had no money for conservation and they had areas that needed protection. I had money but no land, so we formed an unlikely partnership. And that was what I looked like in those days in 1990. I still think it was a bit of a miracle the Forestry Commission, the government professionals agreed to work with me. Anyway, uh, we picked an area that had an estimated 100,000 pine seedlings already there growing from the trees in the background, but held in check as you've seen from previous photographs. So we knew if we put up a fence, those trees would grow and we wouldn't need to do anything else. So this picture was taken two years after the fence went up. I'm standing behind a hummock, which is a mound of vegetation growing over an old pine stump in this case. And there's a little pine seedling growing there through the blaberries. The right hand picture taken 30 years after the fence went up is the same tree and you can see it's now towering many times my height and uh, it's flourishing very well. It's been coning, producing seeds for about 15 years and supporting lots of life. This is the same area inside the same fence, but you can't see the fence here because it's not the edge of it, it's the center of the area. And this for me is the more powerful photograph, very symbolic because in 1990, when the fence was put up, these three standing dead pines were showing the dying forest. So there's still a few living trees in the background then, but these pines were already dead. I photographed it in 1989 before the fence went up, and it was an indication of the destination this whole area was still heading towards of continuous decline of the forest. With the fence up, the trees have grown. And one of the things about Scots pines is they have a high resin content. And if they die standing uh, like these ones have done naturally, um, the wind quickly takes off their needles and small twigs and the trunk and bigger branches are preserved by the resin in them and they persist for decades. So you can see the tree I'm next to there is virtually unchanged from 1989 when the left-hand photograph was taken. And look at all these young pines. None of them are planted. They've all regenerated naturally um, through the process of regeneration. That's nature doing the work. That's the best option. 
That only is effective though, if you've got a seed source nearby. And in much of the highlands, there is no seed source because there's no trees for miles and miles around, no living trees that is. So in those situations, we've also taken part in tree planting. And this was the first tree planting my charity was involved with in 1991, the top left there. You can see a man holding, a volunteer, holding a pine seedling by his planting bag, about to plant next to the stump of an old Scots pine. And that tree would have been alive a century ago. It was probably cut down for the creation of a big sporting lodge, a big hunting lodge in the Glen. So we knew it was a good site for trees to grow. Pines had been there in the past. And uh, we planted a lot of pines there. And in the bottom picture on the left there, you see the same scene after 11 years. And notice that the tree he planted now on the left of the stump is growing well. But look at the stump itself. Whereas in 1991, it was bare and all the roots were exposed because all the vegetation was close cropped to the ground. You can see now the roots are almost covered by heather and there's even blaberries growing on top of the stump. Look again to the picture on the right and that's the same tree and the stump is virtually invisible now. It's just part of it visible to the right of the tree and to the right of me there. And you can see the blaberries on top and a little bit of the wood showing. It's actually very hard to find that stump now. So the area was fenced to keep the trees protected. And as soon as the deer are excluded, all life begins to return. The vegetation recovers. This is the same exclosure uh, where the trees were planted in 1991. And this to me is very dramatic because here you see the fence and look at the contrast between the inside and the outside. Outside, we've just got grass. Grass, of course, is adapted to survive heavy, heavy grazing pressure. If heather or other plants get browsed or grazed, they die. But grass shoots again from the base, and that's why it survived there. And you see one of those peat hags there, exposed areas of wet peat. Inside the fence, on the other hand, you can see the pines that we've planted, not in straight lines, not in equal spacing, trying to mimic a natural forest with an irregular distribution. But look at the heather growing again. We didn't plant the heather, it's grown by itself. And on the bottom left, that green plant there is bog myrtle, which is an aromatic shrub, which uh, fixes nitrogen through its roots. Uh, it has bacterial nodules growing on its roots. So it improves the soil in wet, boggy areas and enables, prepares the way for other plants to grow once the ground is dried out a bit. So we see the whole process of recovery contrasted with this outdoor museum state outside the fence here. This is the same fence on the left, uh, taken from looking along the fence line. And again, you see the dramatic contrast here. It's the other side of the fence. So on the left inside, you see birches, which have regenerated naturally from the big trees in the background in amongst the flowering heather. And outside the fence on the right, you can just about make out a couple of stumps of old trees in the grass. So it's very simple. It's very clear what happens when we give nature a chance to recover. And sometimes the results can be dramatic. This one on the right here, this photograph was taken about 10 miles further west. Uh, there's no trees for miles and miles around, except for a one-eared willow that was growing near the edge of the Afro Afric River. We put a small stock fence around it so it could grow. You can see it in the background there. And remarkably, after seven years, bluebells started to flower. And this was truly a miracle for me. I worked out the nearest bluebells that could have been a seed source were 20 miles away. How did the seeds get there? I don't have an explanation for it, but nature responds when we allow nature to flourish. So ecological succession then is the beginning of the process of recovery. The areas that are grass at the moment would naturally, in the absence of overgrazing, become heathland. And you see that happening in the left-hand image here. Outside the fence, just grass. On the left inside, the brown is the heather. And then on the right, you can see in the heather then, flowering here, uh, the pioneer birch trees coming in because that is what happens. The pioneer trees come into heathland. And in Scotland and much of England today, we've got these heather moorlands, which are kept in that condition for grouse shooting. They should actually be developing into woodland as well. But they too are frozen in time, frozen in an ecological state. And the pioneer trees, uh, the birches and so forth, eventually give way to the slower growing, longer lived trees, Scots pine or where the saws are better oak. So that's the process that's beginning to get underway now.
And once the trees get established, we also find uh, the relationships become established again too. So we now know from ecological studies and scientific research that all trees have special relationships with fungi. This happens all over the world with what are called mycorrhizal fungi. And the fungi in trees, uh, the roots of the trees wrap around the hyphae of the fungi underground and an exchange of nutrients take place for the benefit of both organisms. And here, one of those trees in that area, I just showed you where we planted them in 1991, there's a, a russula there growing right at the base of a pine tree. And that's really wonderful to see. On the right, we've got an aspen leaf um, being eaten by sawfly larvae. Look at the shape of them there, like question marks. Um, and once the trees grow, all sorts of insects appear, and those are the food for insectivorous birds. And those birds, of course, often transport seeds in their gut, including of rounds, and deposit them. And then you see this process beginning to catalyze and accelerate this synergy that occurs in nature as things recover. So wildlife returns when the vegetation is restored. All of these pictures were taken on areas that we've protected or planted trees in. Uh, caterpillar, butterfly, the um, green hair streak there. Crested tit, that's in the tree that I was standing next to in the first regeneration plot from 1990, the area there. It was really great to see that uh, particular bird species back because it's a, a special species of the Caledonian forest, but it's quite scarce. And then a couple of mating soldier beetles in the bottom. So just a few samples of what's come back because of the trees we've been able to grow. And even the peat hags will recover in time. It's a slow process. Here on the left, you see a typical peat hag with the stumps of the old trees and just such a sad, depressing sight. But on the right, that photograph there, there's an area that's been fenced off for tree regeneration elsewhere. Out of picture, you can see the fence in the background in the top right. Um, but the peat hag there is beginning to revegetate after 20 years. And you can see um, there's sphagnum moss there, the bright red moss in the bottom center. Uh, there's cross-leafed heath in flower. And a lot of bog-loving plants come in. And eventually, bog myrtle will grow there and dry out the soil and will eventually get you know, other plants coming in too. So it's a slow process, but at least it is underway for the first time in hundreds of years. So rewilding then, um, as we move on, once we've got the vegetation re-established, we can think about getting some of our missing mammal species back. And we've now got two of them back in Scotland. Uh, the European beaver on the left here, uh, exterminated probably in the 1600s, and a trial reintroduction was carried out under the auspices of the Scottish government uh, in Argyll in starting in 2009. And uh, there's now a population in Tayside as well. And there's a lot of interest in seeing beavers return to many other parts of Scotland because they're what's called a keystone species. They improve the habitat uh, for many other things. Uh, and they have a disproportionately positive effect on the environment for relatively few numbers. And on the right, wild boar, uh, again, former species that lived here, probably wiped out about 500 years ago, hunted to extinction locally. But of course, they've always flourished in Europe. So some people brought back boar uh, for farmed animals and some have escaped. Some may have been deliberately introduced in some places. These are ones that we had captive inside uh, the land that my charity Trees for Life owns in Glen Morrison, where we were using them as an ecological experiment to control bracken because boar root around in the ground and Bracken um, fronds are uh, they're can carcinogenic to animals, so nothing eats them. Uh, the way to control bracken is to dig up the bryosomes, the underground roots, which is what the boar do. So once we get species back, we also start to get ecological relationships occurring. Here on the right, you see some of those boar inside our exclosure uh, on the land in Dundragon. And this is the winter. We had them the first winter, very cold, lots of snow. And within a day of getting the boar back, we noticed that robins began following the boar around. And this is an ecological relationship that's well known from continental Europe, where boar have always lived. And in the absence of boar in Scotland for hundreds of years, robins have had to adapt to a substitute, gardeners. 
And if any of you are gardeners, you'll know that when you prepare your soil in uh, the springtime to sow your vegetables or your flowers or whatever, robins appear because they look for worms and grubs that have been exposed by the turned over soil. So bore were their original partners for that. And these animals, the birds, the robins have a long ecological memory. So within 24 hours, they were following the boar around. And it was quite important in these snowy conditions because the robins couldn't get access to uh, the soil themselves. On the left here, this is a young aspen um, growing uh, in an area we protected. Aspen, uh, very rare in Scotland nowadays, um, but it supports a lot of interesting wildlife. And it grows as suckers off the, pair of the roots of a parent tree. And this was a sucker that grew about a metre and a half uh, in one summer because it had a whole root system of a parent tree to uh, support it. And there are aphids in the middle of the picture there sucking the sap of the aspen, being tended by wood ants. And the ants actually farm the aphids, they protect them from predators, and the aphids suck the sap and secrete a clear liquid called honeydew, which is the main food that the ants live off. So a very interesting relationship. But of course you can't have that if you don't have any trees. So positive trophic cascades. There's been a lot of uh, interest in this because of the work in Yellowstone in the US where wolves were reintroduced um, in the late 1990s and they've been studied extensively and there's been this huge knock-on effect where the wolves affected the population of elk, which is what they call red deer, but the same species, Cervus elaphus, and the elk avoided areas uh, where the deer, where the, um, the wolves could come on them unseen, such as river gorges. And because the elk avoided those areas, aspens began growing there, and the aspens provide habitat for beavers. And this whole chain of effects, which is called a positive trophic cascade, occurred. So we're starting to see that here in Scotland now too. This was first research actually in Ireland. Pine martens uh, were allowed to uh, spread and they've been able to control and limit the effects and spread of non-native grey squirrels introduced from North America. And that's enabled the red squirrels, the native species to rebound. And we're now seeing that same thing in Scotland. Grey squirrels come from Northeast North America where there's no predator like a pine marten. So they spend more time in the ground. They're bigger and plumper and they're easier for pine martens to catch. Red squirrels by contrast have co-evolved with pine martens and they uh, go out to the ends of branches as you can see here to escape from pine martens which can't follow because they're heavier. So we're now seeing the return of red squirrels and the reduction of gray squirrels because of the return of the pine marten. Very interesting. So translocations and reintroductions. Um, I mentioned about red squirrels. So this is one of the staff at Trees for Life. We've been catching red squirrels in areas where they're still abundant around the Murray Firth where I live and in, in, in our surrounds of Inverness and translocating them to Northwest Highlands where there are native woodland remnants which have no squirrels at all. And squirrels, of course, are nature's tree planters. They collect acorns and pine seeds and from pine cones and stash them for the winter. And they never find them all and trees grow from that. So if you don't have squirrels, you're missing out on some of that natural tree planting and forest restoration. The key next step though for Scotland is we need to get some native predators back again. Uh, if we want to have healthy, self-sustaining natural ecosystems, we need to have the top tier of the food web, um, large predators back. So there's a lot of discussion about the wolf, but uh, that's highly controversial. Um, but the lynx is the most likely candidate for a reintroduction in the near future. Unlike the wolf, it doesn't have centuries of prejudice directed against it. It's not been demonized through children's fairy tales and Hollywood werewolf movies. It's also a solitary animal and an ambush hunter. So it's much easier to ensure that domesticated sheep would not fall uh, prey to it than it would be if wolves were back. If we had wolves today, undoubtedly with sheep roaming the landscape everywhere, there would be predation on sheep. So there's a bigger issue to be addressed before we can think about wolves. But ecologically, we could have links back today. Scientific studies have shown we've already got enough habitat, even with our depleted area of forest, to support about 400, wolves, uh, 400 lynx in the highlands. So uh, just as a summary then, I want to mention briefly the principles of rewilding, which are all based on the premise that nature knows best. Very different to what some people have termed the arrogance of humanism, this idea that we humans can do better. And in some cases, well, it's true, we can do better, but in many cases, we're making a huge mess of things as I'm sure all of you are aware of. 
So we need to actually learn a bit of humility and go back to letting nature be our guide. So I've talked about some of these along the way. Number one, you work from areas of strength. You don't start in a completely blank landscape, work outwards from where there's an existing remnant of the ecosystem. So in this photograph on the left here, you can see mature trees in the background, and those have provided the seed source for the seedlings, the young trees in the foreground. So starting from that is an easier way to begin. Pay attention to keystone species. Beavers I've mentioned along the way, wood ants are another keystone species, um, because if you can get them back in place and in good health, many other species benefit. You work with pioneer species in the process of natural succession. That's how nature would do the job herself if we weren't interfering. Mimic nature wherever possible. So I think that's pretty obvious. And uh, I've talked about that in terms of the tree planting. So we don't plant trees in straight lines. We don't do it in regular spacing. We're not creating a tree farm or a plantation. We want a natural forest. Recreate ecological niches where they've been lost. Woodlands generally have a lot of dead wood on the ground, which is where nutrients get recycled. And it's the habitat for a whole community of what are called detritivores. That's absent from most of Scotland today in both the degraded deforested areas and in commercial plantations. There's no dead wood. So we need to get things like that back. Re-establish ecological linkages. Uh, mentioned that briefly about the aphids and the ants. This is a different example here, a different species of ant tending a different aphid. Control and or remove invasive, introduce non-native species. So mentioned that with the uh, gray squirrel. We've also got problems with uh, introduced tree species like Sitka spruce that spread, uh, come from Canada. And uh, it's the most common tree in Scotland today. It's not Scots pine or birch and the most numerous tree is Sitka spruce because it's the mainstay of the forestry industry. But it's also spreading into our native woodlands and we need to take action to address that. Remove or mitigate the limiting factors that prevent rewilding from occurring naturally. So that's the imbalance with far too many herbivores and no predators to control them. Pay attention to species which have limited ability to disperse. Squirrels, one. Aspen, uh, hardly ever set seed. Uh, wood ants, uh, again, they're missing from many small woodland remnants because when the ants reproduce, the queens and winged males fly about 100 meters. So if you've got large areas of treeless ground, wood ants will not spread to isolated woodlands. Twin flower mentioned as well. Reintroduce species that are unlikely or impossible to return by themselves. So in mainland Europe, wolves have been spreading westwards since uh, the collapse of the Iron Curtain uh, in the late 1980s and the dismantling of the old former barrier between East and West Germany. They've now reached uh, the outskirts of Amsterdam and they're in Belgium. Uh, so people are learning to live with wolves in those countries, but they will not reach Britain of their own accord because we're an island. So we need to reintroduce them. They cannot get here by themselves. So uh, finally, re-establish essential ecological processes. Talked about these again, predator-prey dynamics, nutrient cycling. At the moment, we have this huge net loss of nutrients occurring every year in Scotland because people shoot deer and the carcasses are sold to a butcher somewhere in a city further south. Same thing with sheep. And you might think one deer, one sheep doesn't make a lot of difference, but when it's hundreds of thousands over 200 years in an already heavily depleted landscape that's lost most of its nutrients, it's, I do call it, it's like stealing blood from a haemophiliac. So we've got to actually reverse that and allow the nutrients to be recycled to build up the soil fertility again. Let nature do most of the work. So um, that's why it's better to let the trees regenerate if we can rather than plant them. Nature does a better job. Human intervention should be the minimum necessary and designed to be as inconspicuous as soon as possible. And finally, and perhaps most significantly, what I call the green thumb principle. Um, many of you perhaps know somebody, an elderly relative, uh, who's got a special way with plants. Um, you know, their roses never get, you know, insect problems. Their house plants flower and look healthier than everybody else's. We say they have a green thumb. I actually think it's the wrong terminology. I think it's a green heart because it's the amount of care and love and attention they give, which is actually giving a positive effect. And we need to take that same principle, that same attitude, and apply it to our terrestrial and marine ecosystems as well to help re them recover and bring them back to life. Because at the moment, they're just being exploited to death. 
So finally then, um, just a few minutes left before I finish, um, rewilding or ecological restoration, crucially for me, is the work which reconnects. Humans at the moment are heavily involved directly and indirectly all over the planet in disconnecting ecosystems, breaking them up, destroying the links, you know, fragmentation, extinction of species, all the stuff you know about deforestation. So this quote attributed to Chief Seattle, Native American from uh, 150 years ago or so, says, this we know, all things are connected like the blood which unites one family. All things are connected. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life, he is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. So for many people, I think that's obvious in terms of when we destroy nature, we actually destroy something important in our own lives. And we become impoverished as a result of that. But actually the converse is also true. When we engage in the work of rewilding, we reconnect ourselves with nature. We gain something as individuals as well. So for me, these are some of the qualities that uh, we gain from engaging in rewilding. It reconnects us with the rest of nature because to rewild a place, I have to know it. I have to understand it. I have to know it like the back of my hand to know the different soil conditions, where the suitable places are for trees, where the remnant seedlings are, where the special species live. It connects me with place, connects me with life. Very important in a time when so much of our culture, our news is dominated by death. Just look at the headlines and what grabs the, the media's attention all the time. We need to become focused on life instead of death. Connects us with each other. These two young women here came on one of our volunteer programs. They came from Madagascar, which I showed earlier, and it's highly degraded. They're running tree nurseries there, native tree nurseries, and they managed to get funding to come on an exchange program to see what we were doing so they could take back some skills and experience to apply there. It connects people with their own power. How many people in the world today feel helpless and impotent and unable to make a positive difference in the world? I've found my power. I've planted trees which potentially will live for 500 years. The oldest Scots pine in Scotland today is 550 years old. Uh, some of the trees I planted could live that long, supporting all sorts of life into the future. I've found my power. Healing. We're helping to heal a landscape and in doing that we actually experience a process of personal healing, healing our wounded relationship with nature and healing some of the, the issues and burdens perhaps we carry along with us. It's a work of hope because I don't know if those trees I've planted or allowed to regenerate will be there in 500 years, um, but it's a work of hope. It's a statement of I want to create a better future and it's connecting with spirit. The spirit, the passion I have in myself with that that's in other people and that we share and with that spirit within nature. So it provides an opportunity for each of us to make a positive difference in the world. And since 1991, Trees for Life has been running volunteer programs, not happening last year or this year because of the uh, coronavirus restrictions, unfortunately, but thousands of people have come on those. And many have had life-changing experiences because they've come and they've seen that it's possible to help nature recover, to turn things around and to make a meaningful, significant and positive contribution, a labor of love. People pay to come and work on these volunteer weeks. You know, they pay to come and stay in simple accommodation, to work in all weathers and to do something because it's meaningful. It gives them a sense of importance and value to their lives. So returning then finally, uh, just in these last couple of minutes, the need for rewilding is global. So I started with a picture of the earth from space. There it is again there on the left. And I now hold the vision that we need a shared task for all humanity. We've never had that before. It's every nation for itself, every country, every government is still committed to the insanity of endless economic growth. It's madness, it's driving us to destruction. We need a different purpose. And I believe it's time we need a shared purpose. And that surely has to be helping to restore and rewild our wounded world. The one thing that we all share in common, the one thing that we uh, need together to thrive ourselves. So people everywhere, I believe, need to engage in rewilding and the well-being and diversity of our planet and all the species is in our hands. And this is now widely recognized. Some of you may have seen this. This is a new story from just a, a couple of weeks ago, the earlier this month, the 4th of June, the UN made this statement, the world must rewild on a massive scale to heal nature and climate. 
And that went along with uh, the declaration of the years 2021 to 2030 as the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. So this is wonderful. We've now got the body that represents all the nations and peoples of the world, the United Nations, saying rewilding has to be a global priority. I think 10 years is not enough. I think we need a century of restoring the earth, but 10 years is a good start. For rewilding to succeed though, we need major changes in our collective human lifestyles. We need to you know, reduce our demands on the planet. And the most important way we can do that, which every individual can contribute towards, is to make a shift in our diets away from the meat and dairy-based intensive diets of today to a plant-based diet. Here you see a mega farm of chickens. Uh, look at the number of birds confined in there. What a horrible experience they have and huge problems of waste and antibiotic use. And this is the production of soya beans on a former area of savanna in, in Brazil uh, for feed crops for, cow, for cows, soybeans growing for feeding animals. And scientists have worked out that without dairy and meat consumption, global farmland use could be reduced by more than 75%. An area equivalent to the US, China, the European Union and Australia combined, just think of how big an area of land that is. And we'd still be able to feed the world. I became aware of this many years ago. So I personally made a choice to become vegan in 1979. So I've been vegan most of my life. And I grow some of my own food. I grow organic food. I eat locally as much as possible. I eat low on the food web because I want my life to reflect my values and to create the space for rewilding to occur. I want to allow a planet where other life still survives into the future. And rewilding projects have sprung up spontaneously all over the world in the past 20 or 30 years. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, on the left here, this man is planting a tree, no common name, Hildegardia populifolia, critically endangered. There's only 200 of them left in the world as part of the restoration of dry tropical evergreen forest in Tamil Nadu in India. And on the right, Dan Jansen, who's an American professor uh, based at the University of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, studying dry tropical forests in Central America, which were all being destroyed for cattle pasture, burned every year. He decided to stop the burning. And standing there in front of the forest, that's trees that have grown. Uh, it's the dry season, so they have no leaves, but they've all grown spontaneously, no planting there. And behind on the left, these control plot where it's burned every year. And you can see the difference, just like we see in Scotland. So there's projects like this now springing up all over the world. Many are started by local people who are concerned about the future of their local environment. It's not being done on a big international government scale or even by big companies, it's committed local people. So the 21st century, in my view, has to become the century of restoring the earth. And rewilding is how we can pass on a better world to our children than we've inherited from previous generations. Here in Scotland, in the Highlands, we've inherited this ruined landscape, this depleted treeless you know, wasteland, and we can pass on something like this here. This is the first tree plantings that we did in 1991. And you can see the trees growing, um, not in straight lines, irregular spacings, the heather and flower in amongst them. This is well on its way to becoming a healthy, natural, forest ecosystem again. And that's the vision I hold for the future. That happens everywhere. So um, I'll finish there and hopefully we've got a little bit of time for questions still. So thanks for your attention. And um, do I need to do anything to open it up to questions, uh, Charlotte? I'll stop my screen share. Um, oh, no, no, I think, um, yes. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, we're all, we're all here uh, to kind of go through any questions and answers. Um, so, do, does anyone have any questions? I, I have been making some notes, so I've got I've got a few. But uh, if anyone has uh, any that they want to start off with, well, I I, I figured kind of the the first question, um, and this is purely kind of as a futurist uh, group, uh, I felt like we had to ask the question. Um, I, I wondered whether Alan, you might be able to talk about um, the the rewilding, the kind of the life cycle that we're discussing. Um, so we're talking about kind of different change that um, needs to happen, but potentially what is the time scale and the timeline of the changes that um, need to happen? So in terms of the rewilding, obviously the pictures that you showed were over a number of decades. What kind of um, a, a kind of a time frame would they have? 
Well, <coughs> excuse me, that's a good question, um, Charlotte. Um, I think the time frame is an ecological one. It's not something uh, that fits into current human timescales, which are dominated by the end of this financial year or possibly the next election. That's as far as most people's projections go. Uh, and that's part of the problem. We have to get back to the approach of people like the Native Americans who were thinking seven generations into the future. Here in Scotland, you know, for the restoration of the Caledonian forest, a Scots pine reaches maturity about 200, 250 years. So um, the time scale for that to occur then in an area where there's no trees today is 200 to 250 years. That's quite a long time. But actually, in ecological timescales, that's quite short. Um, one of the other ecosystems I've visited, which I know a bit about, are the redwoods of California the tallest trees on the planet, they live for 2000 years. And there's only 4% of them left. So to get healthy, mature redwood forest, which the mature redwoods host a whole interesting range of species high in their canopy, which don't occur anywhere else, um, to get that restored is going to take, you know, two millennia. So we're looking at long time scales here. But if we want to create a viable future for humans on this planet, you know, indefinitely into the future, we have to start thinking in those terms. And that's part of the radical shift that's required, because at the moment, all our decisions are largely dictated by short term greed, you know, which is what our modern day culture is running on. And it's, it's of course, it's still getting worse. So does that, is that helpful? Does that answer you? Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's perfect. Um, Sorry, Brendan, I see you, you've unmuted. Did you have a question? Um, uh, well, I could have. Hi, Alan. Uh, Alan and I know each other from a long time ago. Um, what, what is coming to mind is, is a question I sort of always ask here, which, well, th thank you, first of all, for giving us the most futuristic futures talk. <laughs> I mean, we <laughs> normally look to the future, but we're thinking, you know, maybe the next generation, but, uh, you know, hundreds of years ahead is, is precisely right. Um, you, you've been at this for decades now, and you're famously indefatigable. Um, and there's, there's a well-known quote of, uh, I think, it, uh, a German sociologist, I've forgotten who, who said that in order to bring about change, you have to have, you may have pessimism of the intellect, but you have to have optimism of the will, and you exemplify the latter better than anyone. Hmm. But are you any more optimistic now? Because, you know, we're still careering towards the cliff edge, aren't we? Yes, we are. It's the, the interesting uh, dynamic of our time is I see two things happening. We are careering towards the cliff edge, as you say, and we're accelerating. The foot is still on the accelerator pedal, you know. <laughs> we're still wanting more growth, more of everything. But that's only one aspect of the picture. That's the one which dominates the public eye because it's in the news, it's in the media, uh, uh, it's in government, you know, decisions, all that stuff. But I like to use a forest analogy. If you go into a forest, what do you see? Well, most people see the trees and you might see some birds, you might see some plants. What people don't normally see is the fungi. And the fungi appear usually in late autumn, uh, sort of September, October time, uh, when the, the fruiting bodies appear. But the fungi are underground all the time. And they're working with the trees. Um, they're providing minerals to the trees, and the trees provide carbohydrates from photosynthesis to the fungi. So uh, when we go in, we're conditioned to see the trees. Uh, if you're in a college, you look for fungi, <laughs> you might dig up some soil. So we collectively are conditioned to see the negative in the world today. That's what dominates our media. But actually, there's this huge awakening of interest in rewilding. You know, we've now got rewilding Europe, we've got rewilding Britain, we've got the Alliance for Scotland's rainforests, we have temperate rainforests, who knows about those? And, you know, uh, there's a decade on ecological restoration declared by the UN. And, you know, it's happening everywhere. There's a Society for Ecological Restoration, a professional scientific body, you know, with big conferences, 2,000 people, Adam, I've spoken to a couple of them. All that is happening, but it's not on the public radar, nor are the small scale pilot projects that are getting underway. Every week I get approached by students wanting to, you know, have me fill out questionnaires or be interviewed because uh, they want to get into rewilding. It is the hope for the future. So that is gathering momentum. And 
it's an uncertain future which is going to win out you know the cliff edge race or this you know and um this we're going to reach a tipping point very soon where either you know we're going to really suffer the effects of major ecological collapse or we're going to be able to turn it around in time and we'll still see the the death throes of the endless growth consumer culture but that will be within the larger context of a whole process of rebirth and regeneration now i say this in a human context in terms of the planet i'm not concerned the planet will get on fine no matter what mess we humans make um, nature will recover. After the asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, 75% of all species were eliminated. But today we have more biodiversity on the planet than when the asteroid struck. It took 5 million years for the recovery process. But nature plays the long game. Nature has the indefinite time scale. It's only us humans who think in short term things. So we may see, you know, uh, a very negative future for ourselves, but in the long run, nature will produce something more wonderful. Um, and the task for us is to make sure that we are in that future and that we have a healthy, diverse, abundant planet to share. Sorry, I'm going on a bit. Maybe I should be a bit shorter so there can be more questions. Um, oh, Desmond, you, you've unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, so I have two so I have two questions, um, actually, or two kind of uh, top billing questions. So the first one um, is actually uh, how um, how important has George Monbiot's book Feral been at kind of getting um, interest in this in this topic and I only asked that because it's a book I um, certainly read when it came out and found really exciting and I know it's a book that a lot of other people um, I bump, bump into have read so I kind of wondered if that had um, had a big impact I suppose on the number of people you find being interested in this in this topic and the second question um is one you have kind of um you've kind of touched on um and is and and was mentioned in feral also um which was about how rewilded landscapes um you know not only are they ecologically better but also um you know they could be tourism opportunities employment opportunities um you know alternatives to um the the current way of doing things um so they're kind of there's an economic benefit to them as well and so my second question is um i know you've said obviously we need to um transition to a model that's not based uh, on, on continuous growth but i suppose a lot of this land globally and in scotland is owned by people who um maybe do have some economic interests um at heart so what can be done to kind of persuade those people um, in the short term that rewilded landscapes are, are better because um, you know obviously efforts like your own are kind of uneconomic in that sense you know you're not doing it um, for profit but there are people that um, might be persuaded if they could also make a buck or two. Okay thanks for those questions. Um, very briefly the first one the answer to it is George Monbiot has had a huge effect uh, you know, he's widely followed. He has, I think, 200,000 followers on Twitter or something like that, plus his column in The Guardian. So uh, that has helped get the message out, particularly benefited me and my organization, Trees for Life, because he came up and spent several days with me. And I feature, as you probably know, two yep. chapters of the book. So it was a tremendous benefit to Trees for Life. You know, we got a lot more interest because of that. And he then went on to found Rewilding Britain, which his wife actually is now the chief executive of, and that is having a big effect too. So he's played a really catalytic role. And it's great when somebody who's got the ability to touch lots of people does that. So the second question then about the economics of it, um, I think Scotland is kind of unique in a way because we've never had any land reform and the Highlands in particular still owned in large parcels by mainly absentee landlords. And in the past, they were people who lived in Glasgow or Edinburgh or maybe London. Nowadays, they live in the United Arab Emirates or Denmark or um, Malaysia. You know, people from all those countries own huge chunks of the Scottish countryside. And many of them come here, yeah, for a few weeks of the year just to shoot some deer. So you're right, it's, uh, it's a question of speaking their language to some extent, and that's beginning to happen. Uh, there's an estate, for example, uh, in the Monolith Mountains called Karur, Karar, which belongs to um, uh, one of the people who's involved in Tetra Pak. 
and they're carrying out uh, deer reduction there and habitat restoration and they've now been able to document that the actual size of their deer is increasing you know, the physical size of deer is increasing. And this is something that's not known in Scotland very much, that we can think, think of the red deer, it's called the monarch of the glen. You know, there's even a television series by that name, but in fact, that's a complete misnomer. They should be called the runts of the glen because <laughs> deer in Scotland are only about two thirds of the size as they are in continental Europe and in North America where they're called elk. They're significantly bigger because they have a proper habitat to live in. And there's a Scotsman in Norway, uh, Duncan Halley, a scientist who's done a lot of comparative studies between Norway and Scotland. And he got some data on the size of stags in Norway. And they're 40% on average heavier than stags in Scotland because they have a forest habitat. So it's when you can make that sort of information available to people who are interested in deer, then their, their eyes light up and their ears prick up and they say, well, <laughs> there's something there. So yes, there, there is value to that approach. But uh, for me, I'm much more interested in the ecological side of things. And in the Highlands in particular, because we're starting from such a low baseline, I think in many cases, we have to be willing to restore the ecosystem without any thought of making any material economic gain in the short term, because the land has to recover first. There may be some opportunities for tourism, but I think they'll be relatively small compared to the extent of rewilding that is required. If um, if I can, I kind of ask one a ch cheeky additional question that's um, maybe slightly um, different. So obviously, um, so, um, you know, the, the mark of the Glen is a good example, actually, you know, the, the picture, um, the, the painting. Um, but I suppose the Highland landscape as it is today is loved by um, by a lot of people. And it kind of has a particular kind of image, a particular place in um, literature. And so do other barren landscapes across the UK, you know, um, thinking of places like Bobbin Moor and Dartmoor down um, in the southwest. You know, they kind of um, that kind of austere barren beauty um, is a thing that's kind of recognised as 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 being beautiful and has been recognized that way I guess since um the kind of romantics and the Vic Victorians um is it um I, I guess is it a sh I guess my question is kind of is it is it hard to fight against that kind of um aesthetic image that people have in their kind of hearts and that they've grown to love a landscape that you know ecologically is not the best um and uh, I guess um, you probably is a is a in, in any way will you feel sad? I guess for the end of that for for that of that landscape. So I mean, is it is there kind of a mindset like how much does that weigh on people's thinking um, about about this issue or or do, or doesn't it? You know, is that just the stuff of um, kind of Victorian romance novels? So who cares? Well, there's, there's two responses to that. First one I would say is. Um, definitely come across that and you know people have challenged me and said well look at this great view why do you want to spoil it with trees and part of the rationale for that is most people's experience of trees today in Britain is not natural forests it's tree plantations and they're thinking of regimented rows of Sitka spruce with no light getting in and sterile ground underneath you know, and that's, that's very sad that people have become conditioned to think that's how trees should be. So there's an element of re-education of informing people about what a true forest is. Um, so that's, that's one aspect of it. The other element, uh, other answer to your question is that even in my wildest dreams and ultimate scenario, not all of the highlands are going to be covered in trees. You know, there's natural bogland, there's areas of high ground that are above the tree line, there's windswept slopes where trees would not be able to hold. Um, so you'd always have areas of open ground. So it's not like, you know, there's going to be no vistas and views anymore. Um, it'll be a much more balanced, healthy landscape with trees in the valley bottoms and on the lower slopes. And the, there'll be open ground on the high ground. And if people want to go and climb up there, they'll get a view as far as they can see. And it'll be a much nicer view because there'll be more varied uh, elements to it than just bleakness. So that's my view on it. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephen, I, I think you've got a question. More of an observation than a question. Um, I can fit a question in there if it's absolutely necessary. But 
it's sort of it, it was the the language of money that you know is prick up start listening um i'm wondering if um rewilding is an issue whose time has come and i say that because now that we're no longer chained to the common agricultural policy we no longer have to fund farming um, and the use of the countryside for production of food. And the government has signaled that it intends to make farming subsidies tied to stewardship in the future. So if you want your subsidy, you've got to have 20 different wildflowers on your patch or 50 different, you know, bird species or something like that. And I find that quite interesting because I suspect that the thinking is not too far advanced along this. And it presents an opportunity to guide policy into a zone, the sort of zone that we've been talking about tonight, where, you know, you sort of say, well, if you introduce, you know, this species onto your land, then you get a special top up payment. You introduce beaver, then, you know, we'll give you extra money. Um, so mm -hmm. I think I'd, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in Alan's view on, you know, the deliberate use of policy in order to encourage this now that we can work outside the framework of the common agricultural policy. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, you're right, there is a huge opportunity at the moment, and I think it really needs to be grasped and, you know, political pressure needs to be applied to make sure that, you know, we make the most of the opportunity that's there. Um, there are examples in other countries at the moment. Uh, Sweden is one, for instance, where uh, they've adopted quite a different policy with regard to the wolf, where they actually pay, I think it's in Sweden, they pay people um, who are landowners who have wolves on their property rather than paying compensation if sheep are killed, uh, they actually pay them for having the, the predators there. So there are experiments of this being done elsewhere and I think we can definitely apply that type of thinking here. Interestingly enough, I've been approached this week by somebody um, who's planning to set up a charity. He's, he's somebody who does a lot of yachting and spends time on the small offshore islands of Scotland. And he's got this idea, seeing a lot of these islands which are uninhabited, but sheep are grazed on them and people get subsidies for the sheep. So his idea with his charity is uh, to raise money and to offer the landowner exactly the same money that they get at the moment for subsidies for sheep, to pay them the same amount of money, but to take the sheep off and allow rewilding to occur. So I think a lot of people are beginning to think along those lines and recognize that if we, if we want this to happen on a large scale, we do need support and government incentives. There are good grants available for tree planting schemes at the moment, but they're still largely dictated upon commercial forestry lines. They can be used for native species, but they've got target numbers and densities that, you know, don't necessarily equal those of a natural forest. So there's more work to be done to make the policy reflect um, the restoration of, you know, a healthy natural landscape rather than just another commodity replacing sheep with trees and straight lines. I can just add an addendum as a point of information more than anything else. Um, We've tried to calculate how far seven generations is. You know, you think seven generations in advance. From the perspective of today, given the current movements in longevity, it's the year 2200. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, when you're planning, that's your horizon, year 2200. Yeah. So none of us here are likely to see it. Um, some will see it less more than others. But I suppose Charlotte might reasonably expect to see another turn of a century. No, I reckon you. I reckon you will actually. Fingers crossed for thought, some yeah, yeah, scientific yeah. development. But, <laughs> year well, year twenty two hundred. Charlotte may well reach twenty one hundred, but I'd be surprised if she reaches twenty two hundred. Well, I, there, I agree with you. <laughs> Not in her current form. Yeah. Maybe we'll upload her brain into some computer thing and then download it into a clone. How about that? <laughs> in, interestingly enough, um, I didn't have time to show it tonight, but in some other presentations I've got where I focus more on the big picture of restoring the earth, I've drafted a future history scenario 
which says, let's take Gandhi at his word and be the change we want to see in the world. So I said, let's see if we have this center of the story there, what would it look like? And there's various yardsticks in it about, you know, tiger numbers recovering to 25,000 from 3,000 that they are today and so forth. And um, I have a son who was born in 1995. He's currently 26 years old and he could potentially live to the year 2100. He would be 105 then. So I used him as a thing. And in this future history scenario, I said, okay, let's say he does live to be 105 years old. And his great grandson at the time asked him, well, how did the century of restoring the earth take place? And the answer I, I hoped that he would give if that came is that it all started when people decided to make a difference with their lives, where they started to act from their hearts and put the care of the planet at the center of all human activities. Can I, can I pick you up on that? Okay. I mean, I, I think there's a really good point in there, which is it's when people decide to do things differently, not when the United Nations passes a resolution or the government says it's going to do that. It's when people actually say, well, I'm going to do it differently and I'm going to commit my own money to it. And at the moment, we're talking about, you know, rich guys and what have you. But it's just a matter of time before crowdfunding gets in on the scene and, you know, and all of these sort of like bottom up initiatives. And, and so, you know, you said to me, Stephen, where will you find the change? I would say you don't look for the change in governmental approaches. You look at what people are actually doing on the ground, which I think is what you said in your presentation as well. Absolutely. Uh, change has to start on an individual level and that's why i had that slide in towards the end about the single most important thing anybody can do is shift to a plant-based diet because we all have the ability to do that and a plant-based diet needs about 10 percent of the land area that a meat-based diet does and that is what will free up the land for rewilding and everybody can contribute to that and i found it a very empowering experience to make that choice for myself uh, I've been vegan for over 40 years and I'm healthy and fit. And I'm 67 and I climb mountains and do all sorts of things. <laughs> so I've, I've thrived on it and I found my power by doing that. And again, it's Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world. And I always ask myself, okay, if I'm faced with a choice, what would the world be like if everybody made that choice? And that's my guide. You know, that's the future I want to create. And yeah, people sometimes think I'm crazy and, you know, uh, uh, an old hippie and all that sort of stuff. But I've, I've made a difference with my life. I've touched people and I can see a whole landscape recovering. And that's my power. And we all have access to that power when we start to live from our hearts and put the things that we care most deeply about into practice in our lives. I live in the Fintorn community, you know, which has a low ecological footprint. Uh, my energy comes from our community wind turbines. My toilet waste goes to our living machine, which is processed back into compost. I still have a car because I need to get out to Glen African places like that where there's no public transport. So I have an electric car, the smallest one I could get. Um, so everywhere I'm trying to bring my life into alignment with those values. And we can each do that. We can each make those choices. And while some people might think that's a sacrifice and giving something up, actually, it's a very empowering thing to do. And I've grown as a result of that. So that's what I would say. You're exactly right. The change on a government level only comes about when there's enough change at a grassroots level that creates the pressure that the government has to respond to. So thank you for saying that. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Um, does does anyone have any other questions? No. Well, Alan, thank you so much for coming along tonight and um, giving your talk. Really, really inspirational. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to um, just mention about our next Edinburgh Futurist event. So it's it's actually going to be next Tuesday. Um, we we've got the authors of uh, Scotland 2070: Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, who are talking about the opportunities that Scotland have for the next uh, 50 years. Um, so hopefully uh, I'll see everyone along there. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Alan. That was a really great talk. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, and uh, I hope it's uh, been meaningful for people and. Um, do engage in rewilding, you know, do your bit. Don't 